were did he reply. Despairing of him, therefore, I determined to go to bed and to sleep, and no doubt, before a great while, he would follow me, but previous to turning in, I took my heavy bearskin jacket, and threw it over him, as it promised to be a very cold night, and he had nothing but his ordinary round jacket on. For some time, do all I would, I could not get into the faintest doze. I had blown out the candle, and the mere thought of Gweekeg, not four feet off, sitting there in that uneasy position, stark alone in the cold and dark, this made me really wretched. Think of it sleeping all night in the same room with the wide-awake pagan on his hams in this dreary, unaccountable Ramadan. But somehow I dropped off at last, and knew nothing more till break of day, when, looking over the bedside, there squatted Queekeg, as if he had been screwed down to the floor. But as soon as the first glimpse of sun entered the window, up he got, with stiff and grating joints, but with a cheerful look limped towards me where I lay, pressed his forehead again against mine, and said his Ramadan was over. Now, as I before hinted, I have no objection to any person's religion, be it what it may, so long as that person does not kill or insult any other person, because that other person don't believe it also. But when a man's religion becomes really frantic, when it is a positive torment to him, and, in fine, makes this earth of ours an uncomfortable and too large and, then I think it high time to take that individual aside and argue the point with him. And just so I now did with Queekeg. Queekeg, said I, get into bed now, and lie and listen to me. I then went on, beginning with the rise and progress of the primitive religions, and coming down to the various religions of the present time, during which time I labored to show Gwekeg that all these Lents, Ramadans, and prolonged ham squantings in cold, cheerless rooms were stark nonsense, bad for the health, useless for the soul, opposed, in short, to the obvious laws of hygiene and common sense. I told him, too, that he being in other things such an extremely sensible and sagacious savage, it pained me, very badly pained me, to see him now so deplorably foolish about this ridiculous Ramadan of his. Besides, argued I, fasting makes the body cave in, hence the spirit caves in, and all thoughts born of a fast must necessarily be half-starved. This is the reason why most dyspeptic religionists cherish such melancholy notions about their hereafters. In one word, Kweekug, said I, Rather digressively, hell is an idea first born on an undigested apple dumpling, and since then perpetuated through the hereditary dyspepsies nurtured by Ramadans. I then asked Queekeg whether he himself was ever troubled with dyspepsia, expressing the idea very plainly, so that he could take it in. He said no, only upon one memorable occasion. It was after a great feast given by his father the king, on the gaining of a great battle wherein fifty of the enemy had been killed by about two o'clock in the afternoon, and all cooked and eaten that very evening. No more, Queekoog, said I, shuddering. That will do, for I knew the inferences without his further hinting them. I had seen a sailor who had visited that very island and he told me that it was the custom, when a great battle had been gained there, to barbecue all the slain in the yard or garden of the victor. And then, one by one, they were placed in great wooden trenchers, and garnished round like a pilau, with breadfruit and coconuts, and with some parsley in their mouths, were sent round with the victor's compliments to all his friends, just as though these presents were so many Christmas turkeys. After all, I do not think that my remarks about religion made much impression upon Queekeg, because, in the first place, he somehow seemed all of hearing on that important subject, unless considered from his own point of view, and, in the second place, 
he did not more than one-third understand me, couch my ideas simply as I would, and, finally, he no doubt thought he knew a good deal more about the true religion than I did. He looked at me with a sort of condescending concern and compassion, as though he thought it a great pity that such a sensible young man should be so hopelessly lost to evangelical pagan piety. At last we rose and dressed, and Quikug, taking a prodigiously hearty breakfast of chowders of all sorts, so that the landlady should not make much profit by reason of his Ramadan, we sallied out to board the Pequod, sauntering along and picking our teeth with halibut bones.